thank you very much all for coming today. Um, it's great to see so many of you. Um, yeah, so we're the Post Crash Economic Society. Uh, we've managed to bring you four amazing speakers. Um, before we start, I'm just going to explain to you a bit about why we set up our society and the campaign that we're running. Um, and then I'm going to hand you over to Zach, who's going to introduce the speakers and uh, hand over to them. So, basically, we wanted to set up their society because uh, we felt in our kind of first and second year modules that there was a bit of a, a gap between what we were learning and what we thought we might learn in economics when we kind of signed up for it. And when, when we first set up the society, we did a bit of research into economics education and found out quite quickly that uh, it was much more of a kind of contested and lots of things had happened, um, including protests in Harvard, in America, and protests in France, where economic students had uh, kind of argued against their professors and suggested that the syllabus is needed changing. Um, we looked a bit further and we found out that there were really kind of world famous reputable economists who were putting forward arguments against mainstream economics, um, challenging the validity of its assumptions, methodolog methodology and uh, models. Um, and then we also saw the Bank of England conference, Are Economics Graduates Fit for Purpose? which is obviously what we named our event afterwards. Um, and yeah, so I think basically what we've realized is that econ economics is a discipline in which there are lots and lots of different schools of thought. And we learn, we think, only one of them in depth. And we think that's kind of got a kind of a number of flaws we think it's got flaws because of the uh, effect it has on us as students, but also the effect it has on uh, economics and economists. And obviously it's a crucial kind of thing that the society as a whole understands. Um, and so we want to argue and start a campaign for more pluralism in our economics education and more focus, a real commitment to critical thinking and critical skills, um, and that's right at the heart of what we want to do. Um, so yeah, so we've set up a society, we've got 10 great committee members, um, I want to thank them because um, they've put a lot of the work in to make this happen. Uh, we've also got a, a kind of discussion group every other week um, in which we discuss different schools of thought. And I'd like to take this opportunity to try and persuade as many of you, if you're as interested in this event, to come down as possible. Um, most importantly though, or not, not most importantly, uh, we've got a campaign. And I think what we want this to be is the start of the discussion. So it's great, I don't know, I can't predict how many people are here, but it'd be great if you could go away and talk to your course mates and friends about this. Um, and that'd be the most useful thing to get out of this. Um, is the start of the discussion because it's going on in the Bank of England and it's going on in other places and we'd like to bring it to Manchester. Um, yeah, so I think that's the key thing. Key things over and done with. So I think I'll hand you over to Zach uh, now who will introduce the speakers and let the speakers talk because I think that's what we all here here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Is my mic working? Yes. Okay, I'm glad you can hear me. Okay, yeah, so thank you for coming. This event is called Our Economics Graduates Fit for Purpose. It was named after the Bank of England Conference held in early Fe in February 2012. The bank got speakers from all around the world to come and speak about educational economists. These are like world experts. We think this event is there for particular interesting because it shows that these questions are being asked within the mainstream instead of just by a radical few, with Bank of England being like a key economic institution. As a speaker in the opening session of the conference noted, the crisis was a large intellectual failure. We all got it largely wrong and have been using the wrong intellectual apparatus. There seems to be a general agreement that there needs to be more focus on heterodox education within um, degrees, although the extent to this varies. Employers taking part in the conference agreed, however, that economist graduates have a narrow range of skills and they could, this could be improved. They stress very good techno, technical ability, 
but they said that um, economists often lacked the ability to apply theories properly due to lectures being very abstract and so it being difficult to see what reality was really like. Also, at the conference, a lot stressed the need for more economic history so that economists could learn their theories within the context they were made. I'm very happy to say today we've got four excellent speakers and I'm now going to introduce in the order that they will be speaking. Sitting to my right is Victoria Chick, who is an emeritus professor at the University of London and before that, um, and before that I worked there for 40 years. She has published widely in areas such as international economics, monetary theory and macroeconomics but she is particularly well known for her work on John Maynard Keynes. Um, she has served on the Council and Executive Committee of the Royal Economic Society, the governing bodies of UCL and of the University of London. Um, and I'll let her talk more about what she's doing now, but I believe she is now working on the problems of a zero growth economy. Um, sitting, se second to speak, sitting to my far right, is Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan Leap. He's a senior lecturer in economics at the London School of Economics. He's particularly interested in teaching and learning in higher education and has set up the pioneering LSE 100 course which I'll let him tell you more about. Sitting, oh, and Jonathan spoke at the original conference, which I thought might be interesting to know. Speaking to him, sitting on my left is Paul Omerod. Paul wrote a book, I wrote a chapter in the book about the conference, and um, used to be actually a visiting lecturer here at Manchester. In 2006, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences. In 2009, he was awarded a fellowship at Durham University. And in economics, Paul uses a multidisciplinary approach, making use of biology, physics, mathematics, statistics, and psychology. Um, that sounds very confusing, so I'll let him <coughs> tell you more about it. And he's the author of many books, such as Death, Death, Death Economics, which sold a million copies worldwide. Speaking on my far left will be our last speaker, and we're very, very thankful for coming down, is Ken Clark, who is the head of economics at Manchester. Ken was educated in Glasgow and Manchester, and has been a member of the staff since 1990. He's a research fellow at the Institute of Study of Labour, and has been Head of Economics here since August 2010. He's published extensively in top journals on issues such as the economy of the labour markets, immigration and self-employment. And on that note, I'd like to ask our first speaker, Victoria Chip, to start. Oh, <clears throat> first, I want to congratulate um, those who have set this um, new initiative going. I think to call it post-crash economics is inspired. Um, <clears throat> and I wish it all the best in the world. Um, I'm glad so many of you have taken an interest to, to come along. Um, I'm going to just give a few little thoughts on the kinds of things that are wrong with economics. If I were to set up uh, a talk saying what's wrong with economics we'd be here until Easter <laughs> but I've only got 15 minutes so I have to select a few things to discuss and hope some general principles come out um, there have been many expressions of dissent about economics they go back a long way um, Paul's book that was just referred to The Death of Economics was written in 1994 I think and he's just um, had another look at it in 2001. Um, but, but that's a comparative newcomer. I mean, Joan Robinson, in 1971, gave a famous lecture at the American Economic Association called The Second Crisis in Economic Theory. So there was one before that. <coughs> Stick around, I might need you. <laughs> <laughs> Light sound, yeah. Um, so, as I say, these expressions of dissent about, about economics have been going on for quite some time. Um, but the crisis has focused everybody's minds. Um, you're probably um, familiar with the Queen's question, she said, when she was opening a building at the LSE, uh, if it's so huge, why did nobody see it coming? Now, this is one of the most interesting questions the Queen has ever asked. <laughs> <coughs> um, 
uh, and she got a wide variety of answers from various interested parties. Um, but the, there's a misconception embedded in that question. There were people who did see it coming. And the interesting thing about that is that none of these people were what we would call mainstream economists. They were all heterodox. Now, um, I think that tells you a great deal. Let me see where I am here. This is <coughs> the problem as it was seen by Willem Bouter, who was a founder member of the Monetary Policy Committee, was that mainstream macroeconomic <coughs> theories not only did not allow questions about insolvency and liquidity in the banking system to be answered, they did not allow those questions to be asked. The theoretical framework was such that you couldn't raise the question. Now, there has to be something wrong with that. Um, and the people who did see the crisis coming, um, there's the queen. <laughs> uh, here, I, was, I was looking for her earlier, but I couldn't find her for words. Um, those who did predict the crisis had models of the economy that had features that are not included in mainstream economics. They looked at debt or credit flows in, in, in the financial sector, where mainstream economics tends not to include a financial sector in their models at all, arguing that at macroeconomic levels, financial assets all cancel out. Um, they distinguished between real and financial wealth. They weren't bamboozled, as Gordon Brown was, when he said, thank you, gentlemen of the city, for creating so much wealth. Actually, it was hot air. Um, and they knew the links between the real and the financial sectors. Um, they didn't have this classical dichotomy of the real sector over here and the monetary sector over there, and never the twain shall meet except in the determination of prices. There was a, a much more intimate link between those two sectors. Um, and they used flow of funds accounts. They watched where the money was going, how it was circulating around. So these were the kinds of characteristics of the theories that actually did help people. Um, to identify problems in the financial sector that were about to blow up. None of them are really catered for in most mainstream economic models. <clears throat> now, you could argue, and I would argue, that the problem is much worse than just not having these elements in macroeconomic models. There has been a long program, starting in this country in 1971 with competition and credit control, uh, and going on to two other huge events and lots of little ones, the huge ones with the Big Bang and the Basel uh, capital adequacy, um, called it the first one. <clears throat> Those three events, and all the little events in between systematically and steadily deregulated the banking system. And it was this deregulation that allowed the banks to do the kinds of things that you all read about. Use derivatives, use a high degree of leverage, all the things that made the banks so fragile that when one thing went wrong, the whole thing. Um, banks need to be regulated. There's a reason for that, having to do with the fact that in, they don't um, actually control anything real. They're, and it's as easy and as cheap uh, to create a million pounds of new money as it is to create ten pounds of new money. So they um, have an enormous facility for blowing bubbles, and then the bubbles burst. Um, so this deregulation process went on 
for a good 30 years before the crisis. And economics, I would argue, mainstream economics, was largely responsible for getting that program going, for giving it the intellectual respectability that it had in most quarters. And those quarters included the Bank of England and the FSA and all the rest of it. I mean, competition and credit control that started it all off originated in the Bank of um, and it was a clear free market program, a deregulation program. Um, how is it that economic theory um, did that? Well, there is something called the efficient markets hypothesis, which concludes that risk is appropriately priced at all times, that the market knows how to price risk. Now, if that is true, you don't have to worry about risk. Um, and you don't even have to distinguish, as you ought to, between risk, which is insurable stuff, and real uncertainty, when you don't, we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, so, all of that paved the way for thinking, well, the markets price risk appropriately, and we don't have to worry about it. Furthermore, they took the view that liquidity, these aren't in the right order, you know, I think, but anyway. <laughs> it's okay, maybe I got, got it wrong, but I'll just have to faff it. <coughs> um, no, 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 there we go. Um, there's the efficient market hypothesis. And if it, all assets are priced uh, appropriately, then all assets are equally liquid. You can sell them quickly at the appropriate price. And of course, all assets are not equally liquid. It was on the basis of this idea that all assets were equally liquid that the liquidity cushion in the banking system was run down at an extraordinarily rapid rate after competition and credit control to the point where banks held hardly any liquid assets at all. So they had nothing to back them up when they got into difficulty. <clears throat> now, the, the rhetorical power of the efficient markets hypothesis is enhanced by the language that they use to discuss such things as liquidity in terms of market imperfections, rigidities, and market failures. They're clearly <coughs> nasty things. Actually, they're everyday facets of the world of banking. And they're there for a reason. And the reason is not only that risk is not appropriately priced, but that there are some things about which you are quite uncertain. They come out of left field, so to speak. Um, and th there is very little that you can do to prepare for them. You can't insure against them. That is ignored in mainstream uh, mainstream economics. <clears throat> so, to summarize that little bit, I'm arguing that economics <coughs> has actually given intellectual respectability to the deregulation of the banking system, which allowed the banking uh, system to um, become increasingly fragile until one little thing went wrong and the whole thing collapsed. It's not it's not a good recommendation for the subject. Um, now, the other aspect of mainstream economics is that it has contrived to make itself into a monoculture. There isn't anything else on the table in most <coughs> university curricula. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that neoclassical economists are terribly against monopoly. And yet they've managed to make themselves into one of the best monopolies in town. Uh, this approach to economics is presented as the only theory, and they're jolly sure that they're right. Um, but there are alternatives. Victoria, just let you know you've got three minutes to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, there are alternatives, and I forgot um, critical realism. Tony Lawson will have my head. Um, but there's a whole uh, series of, of possibilities. Now, 
what to do. Should we just say, well, let's have a pluralist approach. Let's break this monoculture and explore some of these other, uh, other approaches. But some would argue that students find this confusing and there is some justification for that point of view. How would you choose between one theory and another? You have the efficient markets hypothesis on one side and Keynes's theory of liquidity preference on the other. Um, who's to say which is right? Well, what I think is that you need to go beneath the level of theory. I mean, there's nothing so dreary as an essay that says, Keynes said this and Lucas said that. And then the essay finishes. Well, you know, that's only at the beginning of the story. The real story is how do you choose between them? Um, and in order to choose, you really have to look further down below the surface of theory um, at what I call method and what Sheila Dow calls mode of thought. Um, now, this is a very complicated diagram and we're not going to go through it. That would take an hour. Um, but I just want you to see that there are three levels here of theory, method, and mode of thought. And the things that go into the mode of thought, like whether you assume that there is certainty or whether you're working in static mode or have time in your model, actually produce the theory. And there are alternatives to this. One of them, um, where are we? Uh, this is a model of Keynes's general theory on the same lines. He has time and uncertainty <coughs> built in at the very bedrock of his theory. Now, when you're faced with knowing that, you can choose what you want to do. Um, there are two approaches to constructing theories. Um, one is idealist, to start with axioms and use deduction. Another is what I call realist, to start from an understanding of reality and try to find the causal connections. There's no doubt which I would prefer, but you just have to identify what's going on and make your choices. Um, idealist models then have to make a link with reality and they have a lot of trouble doing it. Um, you have two objectives that you could choose between, to understand how the economy works or to create elegant models. And you have two criteria of, of success, relevance to the real economy and internal consistency. So you can, you can learn to evaluate the kinds of theories that you're being taught, if you are also taught these links <coughs> between method and mode of thought and the theory, which is a kind of superstructure riding on the top of it. I think only if you go to that level of, uh, of thought will pluralism actually work. And that's my main message. Thank you. Just to say, because I think I forgot to mention it before, each speaker has 15 minutes to talk and then there'll be about an hour for questions at the end. And if you see me put my hand up like this, I'm trying to come this far and it's there. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Zach. I too want to add my um, congratulations to the organizers. I think this is a very important question to be asking um, because not only has the crisis focused attention on economics uh, as a uh, scheme of thought, but it's also focused attention on economics in terms of how we teach it and how we teach economics as a discipline, but also slightly more broadly, how we educate economists. And I'd like to take a much narrower look at the question uh, that you've posed for today, which is, are economic graduates fit for purpose? And start by thinking a bit about what we mean by fit for purpose. And I think probably 
each one of us in our room might have a particular view about what the purpose of an economist uh, might be. But I'd like to just begin by injecting a little bit of empirical evidence into that uh, discussion. With Paul Anand, I've been doing a study of economists in the Government Economic Service, and we surveyed them in January 2012. And I'd like to just give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, feeling for the results we got as an indication of what economists actually end up doing. Government Economic Service uh, is the largest employer of economists in the country. Uh, no doubt some of you at least will end up uh, working as part of the GES at some point. Um, but they're very much professional economists. They're economists that are working as economists within government, but of course not uh, in an academic capacity. So I just want to start by giving you a couple of the findings that we had that I think got us thinking a bit more about what the education of economists is all about. <coughs> the first thing we did, or one of the first things we did, was to ask them on the survey what their principal area of work was. So I think we sort of thought we might get a balance, some saying microanalysis, some saying macroanalysis, other things, but neither of those figured in their, in their answers. What we got in this order, order was our principal areas of work are policy briefing, policy advice, and policy development. Now, you might think on reflection that's not too surprising, but then think what that implies in terms of how we're preparing them. So policy advice, policy development, and then at the top of the list, policy briefing, are all processes which, to begin with, are problem-centered, not theory, model-centered. And they're processes which require an understanding that <coughs> at the least, will be crossing borders within economics and almost in every case you can possibly imagine will be crossing borders outside of economics. That is, if you're really trying to focus on a policy, you're not likely to make much headway if you confine your attention to an economic analysis alone. We then followed that with another question, which was, underlying these areas of work, what are the principal methods uh, and approaches you use? So again, we thought, well, maybe econometric analysis will will come up on top, or maybe policy experiments. The government's doing more policy experiments than it used to. Or maybe game theory. Maybe they'll be doing some informal uh, sort of theorizing themselves. Well, no, none of those actually figured out to be very important. Overwhelmingly, the top method that they cited was <coughs> synthesizing evidence. So again, that spoke <coughs> to this multidimensionality, multidimensionality of the problems they face. And that the challenge is not one of testing a single model and seeing to what extent that's robust or supported by a particular body of evidence, but rather, how do you grapple with a problem that has a number of different dimensions that you've been called on to, to take account of in your analysis? Well, you might think that, of course, the policy focus in particular is something distinctive about government economic uh, service, but there's been another survey done uh, just this past January of business economists as part of the same process, which grew out of the February um, the February workshop. And they found broadly similar works, not policy advice, of course, but very much briefing and synthesizing and things as being very much true of private sector economists as well. And, and the picture that emerges then of, of economists, uh, economics in practice is one that's characterized by three primary characteristics. First, at the heart of it is problem solving. Second, what economists do in practice is to apply economic theories and models. And applying isn't a simple thing. Applying itself is a creative, synthetic process where they're trying to start with the models uh, that we've you know, developed and established uh, in the literature and then use those in a way that casts real light, useful light, onto problems. And then the third area, so problem solving the first, applying economic theories and models the second. The third distinguishing characteristic of economics in practice is the need to communicate economic analysis to diverse audiences. And that really crosses the full range of, of, uh, of types of economics, economics in practice. Well, all of this raises a host of questions, but I'd like to focus just on two questions and really one in the end uh, in any detail. The first is, what are the implications of this for the teaching of economics? And the second is, what are the implications of this for the education of economists? Now, you might think that's the same question, but it isn't the same question because the education of economists, certainly in my view, and I think in many people's views, should be much more than just economics. So that's what I want to say in most of the rest of my remarks. But let me just say something briefly about the teaching of economics. 
one of the things I think that the crisis reinforced, but that other people have identified independently, is the fact that over time, the way in which we teach economics has increasingly become model-centered and highly deductive. That if you think of the core courses that we teach, we tend to organize them around a, a limited set of models, um, and uh, that those models and the underlying theories really drive the structure of our approach to micro, macro, public, industrial, whatever it might be. Well, that has the great virtue of, I think, in most cases, I think it's true at the LC, I think it's true here at Manchester, of uh, <coughs> teaching students how to do model-based thinking. And I think that's uh, a very important first step in using economics. We can argue about the range of models in which that training should take place, but I think the ability to do model-based thinking is an important component of being an effective economist. But what it leaves out, and particularly I think if you think back to how we've just been characterizing what economics is like in practice, what it leaves out is a problem-centered uh, approach. That is what we don't see, and this is true at the LSE, what we don't see in our core economics courses, uh, apart from occasional third-year uh, field courses, is uh, an approach that takes seriously an empirical problem and then says, how do we understand this problem, uh, accepting from the beginning that it's not going to fit neatly within the, the scope of a single model. That we're going to be in a situation where we have to, in a very real sense, start with the evidence that characterizes the problem, that helps us to understand the different dimensions of the problem, and then begin to pull in relevant theories, relevant uh, models, relevant approaches, and so forth. So I think if there's one way in which our approach to teaching uh, of economics has to change, it's in shifting away from our almost <coughs> exclusive focus, certainly in core courses, on a model-centered approach, towards one which is more problem-centered. Now, that's not something that's beyond our, our abilities by any means. And I think there are lots of examples, for example, uh, case studies, approaches, research project uh, approaches uh, that can build in a problem-centered focus in a way that would give our graduating economists a set of skills which is more fit for purpose. So I think there are things we can do, and I, I would uh, certainly endorse uh, the uh, shift to a more pluralistic approach in terms of the range of theories and models that we expose our students to. Uh, briefly, just on that, before I shift over to the education of economists, I'd add one more thing, and that is that uh, I've been part of a group that grew out of the February workshop um, that has been trying to come up with some ideas about how economics programs should change over time in response to the crisis. And it was a group that was uh, a group primarily of economists from different areas, so John Beeth from the Royal Economic Society, Simon Ren Lewis from Oxford, Andy Haldane from the Bank of England, Niff Kraft from Warwick, who's an economic historian. So it's a, a fairly diverse group. Uh, and that group, which is not particularly um, uh, uh, heterodox as a group, nevertheless strongly endorsed uh, the need to have a more pluralistic approach to economic uh, degrees uh, and the need for, in general, for more incentives in the directions that, uh, that I've been talking about, about problem-centered approaches, about the need to have uh, other disciplines uh, coming in as well. Um, the second and final thing that I wanted to talk about was this, what I see as a separate question, which is the education of economists. And there, I think, the starting point is recognizing uh, that if we take uh, problem solving seriously as something we want to prepare our graduates to be able to do in some sphere, then we need to recognize that problems in the real world don't fit neatly in disciplinary boxes. They certainly don't fit neatly in the economics box, but they don't fit in any disciplinary box. So how do we respond to that? If we